Welcome to the Swine Health Black Belt Podcast, the latest health research digested for you. My name is Dr. Clayton Johnson. I'm your host for uh, the podcast, and I'm excited to be joined on the podcast today by Dr. Madonna Benjamin. Uh, Dr. Benjamin's an associate professor in the College of Veterinary Medicine and Swine Extension Veterinarian with the Michigan State University Extension Team. Dr. Benjamin, welcome to the podcast. Would you like to give uh, the audience an introduction and a little bit of background about yourself? Oh, sure. Thanks, Dr. Johnson. I really appreciate the invitation and the opportunity. I guess my the background that I can give to you, and it kind of fits with the intro as well, is that um, I was raised on a pig farm and uh, then farmed with my, my brothers and my father. And then I went back to school and entered um, vet college at University of Guelph or Ontario Veterinary College. And um, so during that time, when I was, I was responsible for the sows, when I was working with the family farm, and during that time, sow mortality was 2%, 3%. Um, our cull rate, well, a lot of farms had a pretty a closed herd, but, you know, cull rate was very, very low. And uh, shortly after I finished my degree, and then I did a master's in residency at Michigan State. And right after that, I was hired by a pharmaceutical company. So I didn't really get to see much, many sow numbers. So fast forward about 20 years, um, I hung up my shingle in Alberta, and I started working with a large system, a large sow system, and um, as director of health. And it really astonished me. It was like I was Rip Van Winkle, and I woke up, and we have high levels of mortality, and we have high levels of, um, of calls of sows, and it threw out the parodies. And you did a very nice job in 2018. You presented some a nice breakdown of what you were seeing in your practice as far as sow mortality. Um, and uh, but before then, I had started thinking about this, and so in my practice, what we had tried to do was implement as much quantitative values, uh, indicators for lameness and body condition score as we could. So we had people putting their hands on sows, training them how to do it that way, um, and we also um, for lameness we used indicators, two quantitative indicators, um, which was um, off feed event. And then also toe tapping if they while they were standing and eating if they were toe tapping. Okay. So we use those and you know and the, and then the analgesic the cost of the analgesic because we had ketoprofen at the mm-hmm. time um, was eight dollars per dose. So that's a that was a sticker shock. Yeah, I could see your head go back. Right. Yeah, that's, that's, a, pretty, a, that's a hard sell. <laughs> it was. It was. And I had my budget, so we had the treatment aspect of it. We did show at least to the owners, we showed promising results in the reduction of cull sow, number of cull sows and longevity. So it, we, we did get to move forward on that, but we didn't have a way to predict what the problem might be, that the way to predict or easily mitigate, you know, we could change nutrition, but the response was so low or so long. And then as you had pointed out, when we think about lameness and we think about body condition, it's really a subjective. I mean, most people can get fat and skinny, uh, but it's the ones in the middle. And what do, what do we gain from that? So we have lots of, you know, now we have the caliper as a tool and, and uh, some, some agree with the use of the caliper. Some do not agree with cal- caliper. But I started looking Start when I joined Michigan State in 2012. I started looking for opportunities to quantitate or estimate and then predict. And um, uh, the AI technology in fruits and vegetables was off the roof. I mean, they they could determine if a mango, based on its shape, was over ripened while it was heading up um, an elevator among all kinds of or whatever you call those things. But you know from from one one processing area to another processing area, they could detect that. So I thought, okay, if they can look at a mango using computer vision or using cameras, why in motion, mangoes in motion, why can't we do that with sows? So that became our our project. Um, I have a grad, well, sorry, he, he's moved on since then, but had a grad student and we started using 3D cameras. And our, our goal was to 
estimate the body condition using the changes in depth. So if you take a step back, if you were to look at a topographical map, um, say you wanted to go hiking and you wanted to see how much elevation and where the high points were and where the low points were, the goal would be is to develop a topographical map of these sows. The, the quandary was that when I interviewed producers ahead of time, you know, what, what does this need to look like? And they said, please don't make us put a sow into a weight crate <laughs> to have to shove a sow into a weight crate. Make it part of our normal productivity. So, so our goal is, is to capture this information while sows are transitioning, while they're transitioning from farrowing to gestation, gestation, and back. So in our, in our first phase, we've, we've had very good um, results on what's called pose estimation. So our thinking was, well, if we can identify the, the patterns of movement in normal animals, and that's where we are right now, in normal animals, and predict where, they're, where on the next step their shoulder is going to be, or the hip is going to be, or the tail, um, that that would be a good thing. And, and right now we're very good, very, very good prediction of at about 92%. Are you doing all the, my understanding on the, the fruits and vegetables part of it is they basically feed images into the computers and that's the artificial intelligence part of it. And then th through machine learning, the computers learn, the computers identify their own visual landmarks and characteristics of what's what's a good one or a bad one. So you show the computer a million pictures of mangoes and, and you define all of them as this is a grade one, this is a grade two, this is a grade three, but you don't really tell the computer why and it learns why. Is that the same? process you're using with the sows where it's all the machine learning that's generating the the algorithms or the data points to determine good sow locomotion bad sow locomotion those sorts of things absolutely so what what we do is we capture videos and the videos are at you know depending on the camera it can be 30 frames per second uh depends on on the scenario that you're in it could be 30 frames per second or you might want to slow it down uh, depends on sow movement. Some of those sows can really boogie, right? Oh yeah. And yeah, <laughs> so in 15 frames per second, you may not get, or sorry, you're more likely to get more frames while they're running than you would at 30 frames per second, or you you don't lose the resolution. So no, you're absolutely right. You have it's it's the the computer sees enough images, and that's why it's called machine learning because it's very similar to how we learn. As a child, you, if you have children, they recognize that someone has an altered gait or that they're, you know, in pain uh, without really knowing why they know. And that's the same thing. There's been different discussions earlier. I mean, we've been doing this since we started in 2016. And, uh, and there's so many advances now in what's considered unsupervised learning. So you don't have to tell the computer what to do does it does exactly what you were saying is it recognizes that this is abnormal so there's an estimation and then a prediction so the estimation is the reading and the prediction is is this a problem and then and the next step is the the interface but that's that's pretty cool too what are, what are some other potential applications that you see of this initial work or or maybe future work needed but other huge applications for the industry yeah, we've we've talked about call sows. Uh, what I'd like to do is I'd like to be able to put our producers in a in a situation where one that they can m provide some mitigation strategy, some useful mitigation strategy. And I I know eight dollars a dose, but you know meloxicam is a lot cheaper than that right now. Well, and even um, I'm, I'm, I'm not I'm not going off Amduka. But if you knew that there was a quantitative response, if she walked through and after treatment, and you saw there was a quantitative response, then then you can encourage that there actually is return to effect. Very good. Well, yeah, it's fun. Yeah, fun and exciting. <laughs> and honestly, Dr. Benjamin, this has been a very enjoyable podcast for me to record. Um, it's wonderful to see you making progress in this area. Um, it's an area that I think is, has uh, been identified for years as an opportunity for producers and veterinarians and the allied industry. It's wonderful to see somebody making a, a, a practical um, approach to it and, and actually generating data that can help farmers. And I want to thank you for joining us on the show and to our audience. Thank you for listening to the Swine Health Black Belt podcast.
Um, if you haven't visited our website, please go to swinehealthblackbelt.com and check us out there. Uh, please do also subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss out on our weekly episodes that come out every Friday. And we really appreciate um, our, our listener group that's out there. Um, thank you, Dr. Benjamin, for, for being with us. It's been a pleasure to chat with you. I hope you have a great rest of your day. And to our audience, thank you very much for joining and we'll see you next week. Hey, everyone. We're always searching for the latest and greatest research to share each week. If you have a swine health related research trial and would like to come on the show to talk about it with me and share it with our audience, feel free to send an email to healthblackbelt at swineit.com. And we would love to take a look at your research. Mm-hmm.